You know, when the spirit of your mind is focused on the gospel, you see its truths in so many different places. Um, creation has a thousand illustrations. You look at creation, your mind's focused on the things of God. You see a lot of things that God's put in there that help remind you of the gospel. You also see it in the unfolding of the lives of godly people in the scriptures, aspects of the gospel. And when I was looking, looking at this chapter in John 21, I saw that. I saw what we see at the table and the death of Christ and the gospel. I saw it there in the events. And I'm, I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit and the way that he, the way that he presents things kind of leads you in that way to think about the, the gospel. Um, just as a background for John 21, after Jesus raised, he, he manifested himself to the disciples in different, different times and different ways. Uh, remember on the two on the road to Emmaus, he, he manifested himself to them. He manifested himself to Mary at the, at the tomb and spoke to her. He manifested himself to all the disciples except for Thomas on, on one occasion. He did that. And here at the Sea of Tiberias, he manifested himself to the disciples. And this is a very precious section of scripture. You may recall the events that, that surround this. Peter told the disciples that were there with him that he said, I go fishing. And they said, well, we go too. And I always assumed it was all 12, but it really wasn't all 12. It was actually, there were, I think there were four other disciples with him, Thomas, Nathaniel, James, and John. They're the ones that are, that are presented in, in, in the opening chapter of John 21. Anyway, these went with him and they went out fishing and Obviously, they had toiled all night and caught nothing. In John 21, 3 and 4, it says, They went forth and entered into the ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. Hmm, that sounds strangely familiar. But when the morning was now come, so obviously this was all night long that they were out fishing. All night long, and here the morning is beginning to break, and they still haven't caught anything. To me, that is a marvelous depiction of the flesh. One of the prevailing qualities of the flesh is failure. It's not that the flesh isn't active. The flesh does a lot of activity, but in all of its activity, it catches nothing. It's very, very unprofitable. Jesus said the flesh profiteth nothing. Not just some particular flesh, but the flesh. Wherever there is flesh, there will be people doing a lot of things and getting nothing done with regards to the things of God. Romans 3.12, here's this word given to the entire human race. Here's the indictment. They are together become unprofitable. They just have no advantage or benefit when it comes to serving God and doing the will of God. They just cannot do it. Now, often we find in the scriptures the gospel is set to the backdrop of human inability a lot of times in the scriptures, okay? And I'll, and I'll give you some of these texts real quick. I'll say a few words about them. For example, how about this? Isaiah 53, 6. All we, like sheep, have gone astray, and there's none of us that didn't. Nobody stayed on the right path. In fact, the truth be known, we all got off right at the beginning. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one, every one to his own way. And the Lord had laid on him the iniquity of us all. There's the gospel. Let me give you another one. Romans chapter 5, verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, there's our vanity. When we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. No strength to provide someone who could stand as an intercessor for sinful man. No strength to continue in the way of righteousness, which are two critical things that had to be done. Nobody did it. We were without strength. That's where we were when Jesus died. See, I'm trying to make a point here that nobody becomes profitable until Jesus dies. Yeah. 2 Corinthians 5.14, the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all, there's the gospel, then we're all dead. You want to know one of the greatest proofs that all men are vain and futile? 
Jesus died. Yeah. There's your proof. That's right. That's right. There's, that, that is enough, although the Bible goes on to declare all kinds of things to encourage us about the futility of flesh. But the fact that Jesus had to die was proof that everybody was dead with regard to God. Futile. Vain lives, like men trying to catch fish, but coming back from an all-night without anything caught. That's the way it is. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 9. This will be my last one. There are a lot of these in the scriptures, by the way. I know, I know you know that. But this will be my last one. You were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. There's the gospel, but there's our vanity. And you know, as I was looking over this text, you know, last week and I was thinking about that text, you know, I realized everybody in this room, we've all been twice delivered. Yeah. Because every one of us have been delivered from a vain conversation. Uh -huh. right. Not a vain conversation worldly in the stereotypical sense, but a vain religious conversation. You're right. You're right. You're right. An approach to God with all these additions of traditions for men. But in all the activity, it's vain because nobody is changed in the process. And all of us have been delivered from that. Now, I'm telling you, if Jesus had not died, you would still be vainly serving God. And you wouldn't be changed. So we see in those men, without the catch of fish, this truth that the flesh profited nothing. And I'm telling you, the reason why we have to continue to say those kind of things and to affirm that is not because I know men make the wrong applications of these kind of texts. They say, yes, and that's what we are. We're just so profitless. And, and somehow they miss the past tense of all those kind of expressions in the Bible. No, we're not, we're not as Brother Jason said, we're not just sinners saved by grace, living profitlessly, okay? We're not living in the flesh. You cannot be saved from sin and live in the flesh. What is salvation if it's not salvation from vanity and the flesh? So I'm not saying that, but I am saying this. As long as we're here in this body, we will be subject to a temptation to put confidence and trust in the flesh. And so we reaffirm these things over and over to encourage us not to do that. You can begin in the spirit and then seek to be made perfect in the flesh. You can't do that, but the only reason a person does that is because they think there's profitability in the flesh. You won't do that if you think there's none. Mm -hmm. And so we go back to the gospel, and what do we see? We see a profitless man, profitless humanity, but we also see a profitable man. Mm -hmm. Now, if you go on there in John 21, what do you see? You see the unproductivity of the disciples contrasted with the productivity of Jesus. <laughs> Jesus had not yet manifested to them while he was on the shoreline, but there he was on the shoreline, obviously within vocal distance because he shouted out to them. And you remember what he said to them? Children, have ye any meat? Have you ever heard the Lord say that to you? Maybe there have been times when you have been laboring for the Lord, but maybe not quite laboring through the Lord. And maybe the Lord will say to you when your hands are empty, do you have any meat? Why? Because only when Jesus is in the thing is it productive. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's only. He is the ultimate productive one. And so he told them, cast your nets on the other side and you'll get a catch. Notice the confidence. I love that Jesus is confident. Yeah. I love that. The more you look to Jesus, the more confident you will be. And remember, they caught this great catch. It was so great that they couldn't even haul the net into the boat. And so they had to ask for help from another ship to come and help them get the net to shore. They couldn't even get it in the boat to get the net to shore. And then John has an aha moment. And he says, it's the Lord. 
So how did he know that? Because this happened before, right. didn't it? In fact, this is how he commissioned Peter and Andrew, James and John, the first time. Mm -hmm. He was preaching on the shore there, and, and they're cleaning their nets and things. And, and then Jesus tells Peter, launch out into the deep for a drop. Mm -hmm. And remember, Peter said, we've been fishing all night long and caught nothing. But they, they did catch a great catch that night. You remember both, both, both ships began to sink. I mean, that's, that's an astounding thing. But that's how productive Jesus is. When he's in the thing, it's unproductive. And I'll tell you this, anywhere you see productivity, you can say this too. It is the Lord. Hey, before you start looking on the name that's over the church, why don't you first look at the fruit in the life of the person you're getting ready to judge? All right? Are they being productive? And if they are, you can say, it is the Lord. Because I'll tell you this right now, the death of Jesus Christ is one of the most productive single acts in all of history the death of Jesus think just real quickly I know I'm starting to go long here and I apologize just real quickly just think of what happened as a result of Jesus dying okay what what Peter called through the spirit the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow I like that I like that the glory that should follow. Here's some things that happened when Jesus died. According to Daniel's prophecy, he made an end of transgression. That happened when he died. He also put away sin, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26. He satisfied God's righteous requirement. He said, see the travail of his soul and be satisfied, Isaiah 53. He spoiled principalities and powers in Colossians chapter 2. Spoiled them, making a show of them openly. I like that just openly triumphing over them in it. By the way, this was in his weakest time. I didn't write that down. Our Savior is wonderful. He destroyed him that had the power of sin and death. He took away the first that he may establish the second. That's why we have a new covenant. It had to be inaugurated with blood. Think of some of the personal things that are involved in the believer's life in relation to the death of Jesus. We are able to die with Christ. Someone mentioned that already this morning. If he hadn't died, you wouldn't be dead. You die with him by being joined to him. We're justified by his blood. There's his death. Our hearts and consciences are cleansed so that we can serve God without being smited by it. We're made nigh by the blood. We're delivered from a vain conversation I already mentioned. And we're kept clean by the blood of Jesus. Just to name a few things. All by one act of obedience. All that happened and more. Now you will not walk with Christ and be unproductive. Amen. Because this just isn't, just isn't how he works alone. This is how he works when he's in somebody. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's why we've been married to another in order that we might bring forth fruit unto God. One last thing. If you go on with that account, remember what happens. Mm -hmm. When they get to the shore, Jesus has already prepared some fish. It's already cooking. But do you remember what Jesus said? Mm -hmm. Bring some of what you caught and bring it. Here, Jesus gave them the fish, mm -hmm. although they gathered it. Yeah. And yet he tells them, you bring to this feast what you caught. Yeah. And it added to the feast. Mm -hmm. Now, let me tell you, brethren, when we come to this feast right here, we are also bringing mm -hmm. what he gave us but we've taken hold of it. Mm -hmm. That's right. We're bringing our fish, so to speak. Let me, let me break that down. You bring to this table a cleansed conscience. Mm -hmm. You bring to this table the, the nearness that you already have with Jesus. That's what makes this table that much more precious because you've been living near to him all week long. Mm -hmm. You bring the understanding that Jesus has given you. You bring that when you come to this table. See? Some of you, you've got like converts, people that you've, and you have the Lord's table with them. That adds to it. It adds to it. It's like you're bringing of the fish that you've caught. We are enjoying, what I mean is we are enjoying the benefits of his death while we're at the table remembering that death. And that makes this table all the more precious. And so I'm very thankful. I'm very thankful for this account. I'm thankful for what God has said about the flesh. And I'm also thankful for what God has said about Jesus how productive he is and how marvelous he is, brother. Now, 
the excellencies of Christ, who has plumbed the depth of his excellencies. But I'll tell you this. Here's like a banner over all that Jesus has done. It's what the prophet Isaiah said. He shall not fail nor be discouraged. Now that's the banner over all his works. And you happen to be the workmanship of God created in Christ Jesus. And if you really are the work of his hands, he will see to it that you will not fail either. And that's one of the confident things when we come to this table, we remember. We remember a Savior that had a difficult task in dying for sin, but he didn't quit until it was done. Amen. And that's a blessing. Thank God for the Son of God. Father, we're Amen. grateful for Jesus and for all that he's done. We're thankful to consider him this morning, to consider the, the kindness that you have shown toward us through the work of Jesus Christ, and we're thankful for the confidence that you've given us through him. Now we come with the things that you've given us from him to this table, and we rejoice together in fellowship with him once again as we remember his death. Thank you for the death of Jesus, the sufferings of Christ, and the glory that should follow. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.